Okay, so I'm going to focus on hepatobiliary today. And uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. If I show three in a row, is that okay? Or should I just... Yeah, yeah, no, go. No, I'm saying three in a row, like this, three and one. The image oh, yeah, that looks good. Okay. So this is a this is a um, an interesting, semi-interesting case. Um, it was brought to us, uh, you know, by one of the hepatologists. This is a uh, study that was performed at outside institution. And the story is that this patient with cirrhosis had... Um, uh, by history had a liver mass five years ago and an outside institution presented with what they thought was bleeding HCC and they did bland embolization and now he came to us and this is the imaging study that they brought in. Uh, the patient also has HIV and has some concern for opportunistic infection so the question is they the question they posed to me are you sure this is an HCC could it possibly be some sort of abscess. So this is the images that were given to us, and you can see the patient has cirrhosis, and you know the, the quality looks okay. And here, you know, it sort of, sort of looks like mass-like with areas of, um, uh, you know, T1 hyperintensity. So that looks like you know hemorrhage. This is the arterial phase, and um, you know, you sort of can see that there is hyper enhancement, right? Some areas enhance slightly more, and Here's, you know, the vessel going through. So, you know, beginning to look a lot like HCC. Everywhere else just kind of looks like a cirrhotic liver. Here's the portal venous phase. You can see that, that there is some, some necrosis in this, in this mass, um, which, which is kind of compatible with history of embolization. And so the question is, you know, is, is this it and, 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 is this, is this the only thing that we see? So then we looked at the diffusion. Um, and again, this is a, you know, and then the resident said, well, you know, it's just this big hemorrhagic mass. If this truly is HCC, oh, and the key care is AFP is like four. So not, not very high. So the, the resident asked, well, if this is HCC, why we don't see anything in terms of restricted diffusion? And okay. Usually in, you know, HCCs don't tend to restrict a lot, but you know, when we see big masses like this, they, they, they often do at least a little bit. Here's a T2 again, kind of doesn't look like this mass is very much distinct from the rest of the, from the rest of the liver. So, and the question is, are we truly looking at the mass? Are we just truly, are we looking at a just kind of funny parenchyma of the liver? And then, you know, when we looked at the very delayed images, you can see that now, now this, this truly looks like there's washout. But now look, look at this, there's a lot more to the sliver that, that you can see early on. So when I looked at this, I said, I think this patient has multifocal HCC. So uh, with AFP being only four, um, and, and the fact that the diffusion was pretty, pretty clean and T2 was pretty clean, uh, we decided to repeat uh, the images uh, on our scanner. And, and here it is, this is our scanner. So, so the difference between the two studies is about three weeks. First, you can see on T2, uh, I mean, on diffusion, now you can see that there's many, many more nodules which stand out including this big mass. So there's some mild restricted diffusion, which is common for HCC. This is the arterial phase. So now you can see that the hyper enhancement in this mass is, is more evident. And now you can see that a lot of nodules also demonstrate hyper enhancement. And then this is the portal venous phase. And now you can see that a lot of these nodules demonstrate washout appearance. And here's the hepatobiliary phase. And now really there's no question that this liver is studded with, um, with tumor. So, um, so this patient does have multifocal HCC. A um, couple teaching points here. Uh, one is that, you know, it's true that multifocal widespread HCCs or aggressive looking HCCs 
tend to give you pretty high AFP, but um, very aggressive disease actually may not. Um, it may be so aggressive that is not making uh, any tumor markers. So absence of tumor markers is not very helpful. Another thing is that um, you have to be careful with, you know, with making certain decisions based on suboptimal images. Um, again, this is the diffusion kind of uh, that, that we know. Um, you know, we, we know how it works. We know, you know, we can attest to the quality. This is the diffusion um, from the prior study and, and side by side, you can see how much noisier it, it is and, and less. So you can see that the, um, you know, there's some much, much more um, issues with this diffusion. So you can't really judge, um, or sh should take this information with, its, um, with a grain of salt. And uh, again, this is an example how EVIS can be very helpful. The original study was done with, um, with extracellular conscious agent. And here you can see that there's no, um, there's no question that these, these widespread nodules that we saw uh, are truly you know, abnormal nodules. Now, some of them individually may be early HCCs, may be high-grade dysplastic nodules, but overall this patient has widespread HCC. Victoria, do you do all of your HCC screeners with EOVIST? We do uh, pretty much uh, most of liver work with, uh, with EOVIST. We pre-screen patients with direct billy. So if direct billy is over 1.4, we automatically switch to, get, um, to extracellular contrast agent. We use uh, GATAVIST, but you know, that's, that's not any, any extracellular con contrast agent. Because we found that um, if the direct bill is over 1.4, it, it's like 98% uh, chance that the uh, uh, parenchyma is not going to concentrate EOS adequately. So there's, we just switch automatically. Other than that, oh, and, and then if the patients are, you know, if the pre preemptive diagnosis is hemangioma, then of course we, we don't we don't use uh, EOS. But for most for most other cases, we use EOS. That's awesome, and. I mean, I saw there's like actually a couple papers that sh large papers that show that um, patient, HCC patients who get E of SMR actually have better outcomes. Right. So there's a mortality benefit uh, yeah. for localized HCC right. compared to extracellular MR and definitely compared to CT. So I wonder if like we should be thinking about that when we make our recommendations. Right. So, so I mean, this is a very controversial um, subject. People either love it or hate it. I am in the love it camp. Me too. Um, but th there are, you can't argue that there are a number of prospective studies that looked at uh, um, adding EVIST uh, prior to either RF ablation or TACE. I mean, there are separate studies. There are studies that looked at RF ablation, studies that looked at TACE studies that looked like resection, and they showed that if you add uh, EVIS prior to the treatment, the patients do better. And the thinking is that EVIS is more sensitive for detection, both precursor nodules and, and like early HCCs. So there's at least one study that showed if you treat those nodules at the time of resection, basically patients, you know, patients uh, uh, do much better. So that's probably where EVIST um, helps. You. Is the argument against EVIST, I presume, like has to do with the arterial phase and? Um... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you have. Um, I mean, you have to get the text to be good. Um, you know, which takes training and and so some learning curve because it is a shorter injection. Um, we actually dilute. Uh, EVIST, so we do 10 cc's of EVIST standard plus 10 cc's of normal saline. So that actually gives you 20 cc's injection and that improves the uh, arterial phase by that, you know, by, in, you know, increasing the window of imaging. And so we, uh, we dramatically improved the rate of non-diagnostic arterial phases. And does that decrease the, uh, the respiratory yeah. response? Okay. Yeah, so patients still still may may have experience you know motion you know uh, short, shortness of breath, but the effect on image quality is diminished because you know the case phase acquisition is extended and, and there's that that so the damage to the images is much less. 
Um, I mean, that makes sense because, I mean, Eovis actually has the highest T1 relaxivity, you know, of all the gadolinium agents. So, I mean, what you do in mixing it with salient so that you just have a longer window to capture it. Right. So it uh, makes so much sense. So, the, I mean, it's a learning curve, right? And it's a comfort thing, right? And, you, and certain things will look slightly different, um, like especially with the mangiomas. And, and um, you know, you have to change the protocols a little bit where the you know you acquire t2s after you have gadolinium so, so there's some changes that you have to be comfortable with but um and you know you know how people are thinking about change uh but you know i i we've actually uh convinced well not we our surgeons our hepatologists are convinced that you know big big adepts of evist and and they're really convinced based on the clinical studies that came out that showed that evist uh, helps with uh, uh you know with with outcomes all right next case uh next case um is another um this is a follow-up uh, study on, on the patient with hcc and the patient had uh several uh y90 uh treatments and you can see that the, you know this was the original tumor you can see it you know just hanging off uh the segment six and five you can see on the follow-up that, um, you know, so purely the tumor looks kind of pretty, pretty dead, very, very good response. But inferiorly, you can see that it's not, it, it's, it's still alive. You know, a good chunk of it is alive, um, which is not uncommon, but. Did it parasitize from the right, the renal yeah. capsule? Yeah. So when we go back and look, this, so you can see the inferior. Inferior is the one that basically has not touched. When you go back and look at this is a pre-treatment study, you can see these parasitized vessels. So see that? So when they when they do Y90, right? If if they, they do obviously if they're the hepatic branches. So if the tumor parasitized the vessels elsewhere so, so the, obviously uh, you know the agent did not never reach this this area so that area never died so the question was where where are these parasitized vessels coming from and i think some of them are coming from intercostal but when you have parasitized vessels it's hard because you know they, they're they're not they're often non-anatomic um so now they're trying to figure out if if there's a way to want you know to target this inferior part. I'm not, I'm not sure that they'll be able to do that. Although they're trying to see if they can try with one of the intercostal and, and get that. Uh, but this isn't, you know, this is just an example of how, you know, this information um, would have been very important or, or relevant uh, preemptively uh, for the IR guys to know that the inferior part um, may not be targetable. Yeah, my IR, IR guys told me that if it's hanging off the right lobe like that, they always go also inject the renal renal capsule and the um, intercostals. And then if it's at the hepatic dome, you can um, parasitize off the um, phrenics. Right. So they'll go inject those. Right. Those, those are not, not, not that easy. I know that they, they've had a bunch of um, complications when they try to get phrenic and intercostals because they're such small and babies. Okay, so the next case is, this is a young woman in her 20s and she came in with abdominal pain and leukocytosis and they did, you know, right up a quadrant ultrasound and found uh, masks. And Your sound is a little blurry, if you can. Um, I mean, is this better? Better, yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is a young woman in her mid-20s and she had presented with abdominal pain and leukocytosis and then she had... Um, she had, uh, what do you call it? Uh, she had an ultrasound that showed some masses. And then, so of course she had a marfil evaluation. So you can see that she has these, you know, big lobulated uh, mass kind of hyper enhancing the arterial phase. And then kind of on the portal venous phase is not, um, is not washing out. And you can see there are multiple other lesions, uh, similar kind of sort of enhancing and either remaining you know, retaining enhancement or just, you know, kind of iso enhancing. And on hepatobiliary phase images, you can see that these masses do not concentrate e list. So, um, I'm sorry, did you say the patient had like hepatitis or 
What was the patient's? No, she came history? in with she came in with abdominal pain and leukocytosis, and here it oh. is on a hepatic on a diffusion. You can see all these masses kind of, um, you know, have restricted diffusion. Um, notice the lymphadenopathy. Hmm. I would have thought in a young woman like you know adenomas could do this. Right, that's what I thought when I. Uh, you know, I, I saw this case as a follow-up, so I didn't read this original case. But when I first, you know, looked up on, on the prior, I was like, oh, well, these are adenomas. That's pretty cool. But, you know, notice there's no, there's no internal fat, which is not required for adenomas, but it would have been helpful. Um, and here's the, so she had a biopsy. So I'll tell you what the, bio, the, the result is, but I want to show you what the follow-up CT looked like. You can see that this thing, these masses have decreased in size. So, so you know, these are not, these are not pseudo lesions. But so these are these are real lesions, but they're not adenomas, right? We don't expect adenomas to to decrease in size. Wait, she wasn't treated with anything. She was treated. So oh. this is after treatment. Uh, wait, in that diffusion, can you scroll up through the the big mass? On diffusion, yeah. Yeah. Because with those other lymph nodes, you could think about lymphoma. Right. So this is actually what it ended up being. It's a very, they, they biopsy the masses. And this is lymphoma. This is T-cell lymphoma, which is, a, you know, this appearance is not typical of adenomas, right? They usually, I mean, of lymphomas. They usually either kind of infiltrating or just, um, you know, I've seen them as small masses. I've seen in patients with with HIV, which this patient doesn't have, like these aggressive looking necrotic masses, which ended up being lymphomas. But I've never seen lymphoma in a, you know, otherwise healthy, you know, person to, to give you these hypervascular masses, but that's what it was. So th these are all lymphomas. Victoria, uh, it almost looks on that right screen, like the, um, like if, the one you were scrolling, it looks uh, like vessels are crossing through it. So that maybe is like a... Right. So, right. So, so in retrospect, you kind of look at it, but, but then, you know, obviously, you know, if you're looking prospectively, you can convince yourself it's not really scrolling through, it's just on the edge, right? So I don't think this is a, um, something that can be uh, prospectively uh, diagnosed. I think that I would have, I would have favored adenomas uh, incorrectly. Um, I think maybe here the, the lymphadenopathies, which should, should kind of, um, maybe you know raise a red flag that these are not your typical adenomas um but other than that i, I you know the margins are also a little lobulated i mean i like i was reading um about adenomas and i guess typically adenomas have nice like uh, no they could they, they can no really they can look like this <laughs> okay <laughs> They really can. Well, I think lymphadenopathy, these big- Yeah, big, and splenomegaly too, but this is all like retrospective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, uh, but you know, she had, she had a biopsy and this was a T-cell lymphoma. All right, my final non-liver case, the full hepatobiliary. This is a older person uh, I think, um, that presented with, I believe jaundice. Um, and you can see that there's a huge gallstone. Um, at the, you know, at the bifurcation of the common hepatic duct, causing biliary tree dilatation. Um, so this is why this person presented. But then look at the gallbladder. You can see the gallbladder has like um, an unusual appearance, right? It, ha it does have like uh, kind of almost intramural cysts, which when we, you know, when we think about, when we, when we talk about intramural cysts, right, we talk about uh, adenomyomatosis, but this kind of looks weird, or not not like your typical adenomyomatosis where you, you have that you know rosary sign. These 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 intramural cysts are kind of a little more irregular, like variable in size. There's some sort of something in the green side of it, and kind of just funky looking. Um, there was some enhancement there, which you know neither here nor there because we can see enhancement with adenomyomatosis. Anyway, so this was. Um, Read as you know, kind of atypical, um, either atypical adenomyomatosis. We really can't exclude, um, you know. Unfortunately, it's not a great quality study, but 
you know, it was basically read as cambry exclusive sort of weird tumor. And the patient was sent for, um, the patient was, was um, went for surgery. Artie, I know you're going to get this one. Go ahead. <laughs> it was actually like, confu- well, Masood says mucinous neoplasm of the gallbladder. Yeah, the IPNB. Uh, so this is, this is called, uh, yes, but one step before that, this was called intracyst- intracystic papillary neoplasm. And it did have force of invasive adenocarcinoma. So this is a one step before um, mucinous uh, gallbladder neoplasm. Um, yeah, so, so this is, uh, from what I've read, these are rare. And they're equivalent to IPMNs in the pancreas. So like you can think of them in the same. They're pre, pre-malignant tumors and they're uh, precursors of mucinous uh, uh, gallbladder cancers, which are very uncommon. And that's what they look like, um, kind of like these, these, these cystic thingies. Um, hold on, let me just bring up the... Uh, uh, that's it. Um, so you can see... Um, this, this is the path and this is what they look like, um, you know, on gross path, just, just like that, but just um, variable, you know, cystic structures. And in this case, sort of looks very similar to our case where you have kind of weird looking cysts with internal debris. You can see this here as well. Um, so this is what they are. They're uh, pre-invasive neoplastic lesions, uh, like uh, similar to uh, IPMNs of the pancreas. Another interesting part of this case was, you know, the patient, anyway, the patient had had his uh, uh, cholecystectomy and about a month later came in sick. Two months later, I remember. But uh, now you can see that the, the, the stone they never took out. I don't know why. You can see that the, now that the biliary dilatation is much, much worse than, than pre-surgery, you just look, you know, put T2s side by side, you can see. And you can see now that the, uh, the signal intensity in the, in the dilated ducts is no longer, let's say, as clean as the fluid on T2, right? It's a little less bright. And um, this was MRCP without contrast. So I don't have pre and post contrast, but you can see here, just kind of this big stone and, and you can see the liver is quite heterogeneous. Notice you see the foci of air um, as susceptibility um, artifacts. And uh, so this was, this was actually, um, uh, what do you call it? cholangitis. And there was air in, in the biliary tree despite having the, you know, this huge obstructing calculus. So this was, Super infection with uh, um, you know uh, air producing organism. Uh, is there any possibility like those bile ducts are filled with mucin? Because it seems like the they're so engorged looking. Like, but this 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 the, the difference between these two scans is um, let's see, it's uh, six weeks. Yeah. So um, six weeks, I mean, it's possible, but like, look, this is an abscess, right? With little focus of air here. Um, these are force, I mean, it's possible that, that some of this is mucin to start with. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say if the patient has also concomitant some sort of IPMN like of bile duct, but there certainly is super infection on, on the follow-up study. Mm. So the patient was very sick. All right, these are my cases. And one last question. They didn't have a sphincter rotomy anywhere in between. Like they didn't try to go fish out that stone, it sounds like. No, um, I actually don't, don't understand why. Um, we did, we, you know, the patient did have the stone and I, so I don't know why they, they didn't try to take it out at the time of the original surgery or something. Uh, but sphincter rotomy here is not gonna help, is not gonna explain anything, right? Because the stone is obstructing. Like you wouldn't expect the air upstream to the obstructing stone just from sphincterotomy, but they didn't. It was it was just they just did cholecystectomy. Mm. Cool. I have a couple of ICPN cases that don't look like that, but they look like they have like these papillary fronds. Um, they can be like carpet lesions and multifocal and um, very like friable. 
So um, that was a really cool case. Yeah, I mean, I've never seen anything like the t-shirts. I just, I just saw, looked at the gold bar. I was like, Adam gold bar looks funny. Yeah. That was really funny. <laughs> okay, Rupa, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me, Arti? Yes. And what do you mean by cookie session was very informative? Oh, no, no, that, that was uh, cookie had a session um, earlier that I heard. Victoria had she had tweeted about it, so. Oh, okay. It was probably a private message, which I ended up sending on the group, but it was a great talk, so. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So starting with this CT patient was 60 years old. Um, this was an outside scan. Came in with days worth of cramping, right lower quadrant, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Anything so far? Maybe I'll show the coronals if I... Did you hear me speaking or no? No. Oh, I said there was dilation of the terminal ileum with an enhancing nodule at the ileocecal valve. Okay. And a couple of other adjacent lymph nodes. I'm wondering about like neuroendocrine tumor causing okay. a uh, obstruction. That's a great thought. So and outside, unfortunately, I don't think they picked up on the nodule. And I think this is important to look at it on coronals. It kind of looks at you on the coronals and you appreciate the nodes so much better. There is adjacent bowel wall thickening. So this got read as just um, like an enteritis slash colitis and she was treated very non-specific. So this was a three month scan. She came back three months later after the first one. And funnily enough, things got a little better. All that acute mural edema we saw in the colon and TI had gotten better. Um, the nodes also seemed like they were slightly smaller, not any bigger at least. And this was our enhancing mass again. So this was unfortunately around the COVID time. So even though she was advised a colonoscopy because her symptoms got better and the scan was quote better compared to here, she decided to just wait it out and then came back a few months after this, almost six months after this. And then this is, this time we did an MRE because they wanted to know what was going on. And MRE, same things. We see edema in the TI all around the base of the cecum. And here are those lymph nodes. And on early post-contrast images, it showed really nice kind of nodular or mass-like enhancement. This node had now become centrally necrotic. There were more nodes. And now I think we were beginning to see a little more desmoplasia and tethering, which was starting. So it's just one of those pitfall cases where if we don't pay attention to this nodular pattern of enhancement, it, this could easily all get misinterpreted as an IBD-like picture. It's a great location. There is bowel wall thickening. But few things to remember are um, neuroendocrine tumors will do the same thing as IBD. Symptom-wise, they will come with diarrhea, crampy pain, etc. Location is great. And the TI ones are the second most common type of IBD. And even at diagnosis, 50 to 60% of them apparently will have gone to the nodes or liver. And unlike the more jejunal ones where we see large mesenteric masses, in the ileal ones, we may only see neural nodules. And just like how they cause desmoplasia in the mesentery, these ones can cause mural desmoplasia. And all that is, is because of dense wall fibrosis. And now they say dotatate is the most sensitive and specific scan. We used to do octreo scans on these for a long time, but now the dotatate pet is much better than octreo scans. So this was just a nice picture. It kind of reminded me of our case um, where we had a mural nodule 
and then this was that mural desmoclesia and then the other buzzwords they talk about for this are these hairpin kinks which happen because of the desmoplastic reaction and long segment um, terminal ileal thickening other things to think about when you see enhancing nodules in and around TI endometriosis for sure that can change with menstrual cycles lymphoma would have a much more mass like homogeneous solid appearance Crohn's patients can get adenocarcinomas. That's something to remember. And I was just reading about it this morning. Crohn's is also known to coexist with carcinoid. So they can, they are predisposed to getting um, neuroendocrine tumors because of the long-standing inflammation and the metaplasia that happens in these Crohn's patients. So I think if we pay a little more attention to the nodularity enhancement and not get fooled by everything that is in a patient who has diarrhea, everything that's on MRE is an IBD. I think that's a helpful reminder. That is all I have. Rupa, there was a, a nice presentation at RSNA by Meg Lubner in Wisconsin, and she um, she was showing challenging cases. And one of them was a series of neuroendocrine tumors. And they did a study, I think, at Wisconsin where the mesenteric mass and the primary tumors were missed in like 60% of prior scans. Right. And so like she showed a case where like this was missed on seven prior scans kind of thing. Yep. And it's kind of like we you really need to add that to our search pattern. Yes. TB, yes. Masood as do you include TB in your differential? Um, not seen a whole lot of TB in this part of the world, but really the nodularity and that arterial phase hyper enhancement are much more like a tumor. And, and on the later MR, definitely the nodal increase in size, the necrosis in the nodes and the desmoplasia, I think, go away from TB. But yeah, in the correct endemic setting, definitely. TB, TB is when one of those TI disease differential always. So I saw a good RSNA one too by J.G. Fletcher and their group, which talks just about neuroendocrine. And in that, they showed a bunch of scans where using octreo scans, they had missed many nodal mets and how dotated like shines compared to octreotype so yeah and actually who somebody i can't remember who it was but they show oh, desiree morgan did a neuroendocrine um in yes. the session and um, a lot of bone mets are missed um on ct mr and on octrea scan and yeah. so, so i think dota tate is the way to go for these yeah my new friends were just telling me that it's actually i think just as ex like the same price or even cheaper it than is. octrea scan and it's like easier to make yeah yeah, and, and uh, I think the prep for Octreo scan is a lot more also. For Dota date, it is not as much as what that article said. Awesome. Um, I have a few cases, but does anyone else have cases? I have one case. Okay, go. Okay. So where is my blue box? Where's my blue box? Um, I'm trying to share part of my screen and I, um, screen share. Oh, here it is. Where's my blue box? Okay. Okay. Um, so this is a, um, a patient with sort of, um, a retroperitoneal, uh, mass, uh, and we call, we had called this sort of a lipoma dyskinesia, sort of liposarcoma along that line. Um, and I'm showing this case to you because the 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 mass was resected, um, and the path came back as um, inflammatory pseudo tumor. Um, so there's this really great article um, in AGR. It's called, like called the Great Mimicker, uh, referencing inflammatory pseudo tumor. Uh, so the, um, and I I, I even after reviewing some of the cases, I don't know that we would ever call a um, inflammatory pseudo tumor prospectively. I mean, I guess that's why the article was um, titled The Great Mimicker. Um, anyways, so I, just a quick review of um, inflammatory pseudo tumor. Uh, so they have inflammatory cells, uh, plasma cells, lymphocytes, uh, and collagen, and the etiology is unknown. Um, and it's differentiated from lymphoma because lymphoma is usually a monoclonal population of either B or T cells, whereas inflammatory pseudotumor contains both 
Uh, plus it has um, plasma and infl other inflammatory cells. Uh, so I, the inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor is a type of inflammatory pseudotumor, and that was the pathology diagnosis after resection in, in this case. Um, and these uh, tumors contain my myofibroblast, um, but it's, it's under the umbrella of inflammatory pseudotumor. And it's usually, it can happen anywhere from head to toe. Uh, and we usually see this in like young, um, the young population. Uh, and I guess if the patient has an ALK mutation, it actually portends a very good prognosis uh, compared to those that uh, don't have the ALK mutation. Uh, so there's, I, there's a bunch of images from that AGR article uh, that, that all came out, or, you know, pathology proven inflammatory uh, pseudotumor. So there's one here, for example, in the hilum. This reminds me of this, the lesion that, a case that um, Victoria had presented in the past, uh, a, a pseudotumor in the liver. Um, and then uh, it, it looks very different. And I, I don't know that we have specific imaging features to direct us towards this specific diagnosis. Um, and here's another case here posteriorly. Um, and these are all pathology proven inflammatory pseudotumors. Um, here in the hilum, which looks just like a cholangio, and I would call this cholangio 10 out of 10 times if I were seeing this perspectively. Amr was asking if you can show your case again. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's. Yeah, that's so fatty. That's like. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like, it looks like a liposarcoma or... Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, as far as those liver ones, though, I, I, sometimes I try to bring it up if, like, I have a really weird-looking liver mass <laughs> and I can't figure out anything else. And it, sometimes if you'll Google, you know, like, you'll Google all these in, um, inflammatory pseudotumor liver images, it'll look like a lot of some of these weird liver masses. So. But, yeah, it's basically a retrospective diagnosis. Uh, Omar says, no way we can call them prospectively. Uh, okay, I'm going to go. Oh, I seem to be. Okay, you guys can see in here, right? So this first case is an older gentleman. And I've logged into my phone so I can actually see the chat. So, oh, so please speak up or chat in what you think that this could be going on here. Lymphoma. Good, excellent. So um, and I'll just show you the coronal. It's pretty dramatic. Um, so this is the whole thing is the stomach, markedly thickened uh, stomach, but without um, obstructing, without uh, upstream gastric obstruction. Um, do you have any suggestions of what kind of lymphoma this could be? Like a B cell? Yep. And any more specifics? <laughs> Pushing it now. Tissue. Sorry, what? What do you think? The malt lymphomas, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. Yes, exactly. Gitanjali is the master of the obscure diagnosis. <laughs> um, so, this is a malt lymphoma. Um, so, I was just reading about it. So, this is also known as extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma. It's a type of B cell lymphoma. And it actually has a much, much better prognosis than other B cell lymphomas. Um, and it cause, it can cause this, but it can cause this very extensive uh, thickening, but it's actually low grade and they do very well. Only 10% actually progress to more aggressive lymphomas. And the other major fact is that um, they, 90% of them are associated with H. pylori infection. So in addition to um, treating with chemotherapy, they will give antibiotics. Um, and uh, that's one of the things they use to treat these tumors. And the patients usually do very well. So even though it looks huge and crazy, it's um, this was a malt lymphoma. Okay. Um, this was a younger patient who had this retroperitoneal mass. I'll show you in the coronal. Any thoughts? Yeah. 
Swatching on this as cystic pheo. Good. And um, that's actually what this was. This was a, uh, pheo, a, a paraganglioma with extensive um, cystic degeneration. So um, when I saw this, I had previously had a cystic schwannoma that looked like this. So I was convinced it was gonna be a cystic schwannoma. Um, I, hadn't, I have not previously had a paraganglioma that was this cystic, um, but I was looking in the literature and apparently about 60 to 70% of um, especially retroperitoneal paragangliomas can have cystic change. So they can either be mostly solid with like small little cystic areas, or they can have a lot of central um, cystic degeneration and hemorrhage. So um, great job, Swachananda. Swachananda, sorry. Um, okay, this is my next case. So I want you guys to kind of tell me what this hyperdensity is. Go to the brain. Treatment for a, like a lymphatic leak. Yes, exactly. So um, this was a patient who had a nephrectomy and had chronic um, chylus ascites. They had this drain in place um, and they were still putting out like liters of um, chylus fluid every day. Um, so they've actually had multiple lymphangiogram procedures and um, they've been basically like sclerosing um, their lymphatics. And you can see actually this part where there's like more um, outside of the lymph nodes. This was like an extravasated area on like their most recent lymphangiogram where um, they treated this, this kind of like uh, extravasated area. Uh, but they were actually doing the CT scan to plan where they could um, continue to try to do more treatments. So for example, they're going to use CT guidance and like target these areas that um, there's still lymphatics there that are, that are not um, treated and are not staining with this lipiodol. Um, so they've gone back in a couple of times now and targeted other areas that are still, they still think um, could be leaking. And another interesting part of this case uh, is they have all this um, hyperdensity in their lung bases. And I mostly had seen this previously with patients who have aspirated um, like hyperdense, you know, barium or water soluble contrast. Um, but this was actually the lapiodol that had traveled through the cisterna chile, through their thoracic duct, um, out, out in their pulmonary arteries and then into their lungs. So I asked the you know, IR guys if this was expected and they said this is expected, um, it's not uncommon, it doesn't uh, damage the lungs and usually it slowly resolves over time. And then this is my final case. Um, what do you guys think about this? So we see this um, gallbladder. And we kind of see this process at the base of it. Do you have the coronals? Mm-hmm. Like an intrahepatic abscess from a perf coli? Yeah, so that was one of the first uh, thoughts was, um, is this just like the, the main bladder cancer? Yeah. yeah, the question here, is this a perforated gallbladder with an abscess or is this a tumor? And um, I think it's a little, you know, it could it, like on first glance, like, oh, it could just be a perforated cholecystitis. But I think the key is, you know, this look really looks kind of uh, gnarly and um, tumor like. Um, there was some, there were even some lesions in the liver. And so it was also brought up, like, could there be, um, could this be like a perforated coli with intrahepatic abscesses and an abscess, early abscess could look like this, but I really think that there's like too much soft tissue here. There's like nodes and soft tissue. There's another lesion that looks pretty um, soft tissue, like dense. Um, they did end up getting an MRI and you can see there's like lots of evil gray here. 
um, intrahepatic lesions that are evil gray. Um, the gallbladder there has this like thickening at the base of it. So even though the rest of the gallbladder looks good, we ended up biopsying this and this was a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. We presume or we think that it probably came from the gallbladder, um, but some, when it's this poorly differentiated, they can't you know, fully tell us that it's uh, pancreatic or biliary origin. But so um, just a little pitfall when you see something that looks like a perforated gallbladder, but it has like a lot of soft tissue around it. Um, also think about it, gallbladder cancer. Yeah, Rupa says perforated from tumor with abscess, too much solid, yeah. Okay, that's, those are my cases. Arti, I have one case. Okay, great. Can I share? You should be able to. Yep. So this is a 29 year old lady uh, alcoholic uh, presented with abdominal pain and some hematomesis. So fats at T2, haste, MRCP, um, in and out of phase, pre-arterial phase and portal venous phase. And I can scroll here. I can do this if everybody wants to see. T2. Did you say they have HIV? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. So it was red. It was red as a portal hyalur mass, and um, the patient has had two biopsies since then. Victoria is saying lymphoma, unusual IgG four. Um, Amr says I've seen this before. I actually feel like I've seen this before too. Like someone, maybe someone from your group presented this. Uh, no, this is from last week. So. Oh, okay. Um, Maybe Rupa may have. I don't. I don't know if she did, but we didn't have. Well, the I no, it's a new case. Okay. Uh, another uh, suggestion was portal cavernoma. So um, whoever said portal cavernoma got it absolutely right. So this is interesting because the differentials we gave were exactly what were said: lymphoma, IgG4 disease, um, and uh, so when I was reading this case. Uh, it, it, there have been two biopsies and every time the biopsy, all it says is fibrous tissue. And uh, so I just did a Google search of a mass like portal cavernoma because they have, you know, because there is portal vein thrombus, you don't see it at all. And uh, this is basically exactly what it looks like. I will show you. Uh, cavernous transformation, we know what that is. But if you look at this picture, it looks exactly like that. And there are, there are, there's an AGR article and there are a couple of other case reports that have described that. And interestingly enough, this was in the morning of that day. And let me show you one companion case. Exactly the same in the afternoon. Wow. Much less. Wow. You no, know, yeah. I think I feel like Gitanjali or Rupa showed this case be, uh, one something like this before, and and at, was asking for our opinion. Uh, maybe we because we yeah they may have shown it, but we didn't know what the path was. Yeah, but, it's amazing. But now we have a path, and and again, it's it's interesting. This the CT is from 2014, so this these are two different cases, but they look exactly alike. They came on the same day, and they look like not many it looks like a mass. And I have never seen portal cavernomas look like this, like solid like this before. Cool, so and do you, do you know what, like, what did they say was the pathophys? Like why is it? Basically is it like they said it's fibrous tissue. Mm. Uh, over time, there are fibrocytes that form there and it, all, the, all the veins become like fibrous tissue, basically. And mm. uh, if you go back here, I just want to show you an interesting, so our IR folks did an ultrasound biopsy, but they, they always do a cone beam CT with it. And you can see the enhancement on the portal venous face. Wow. And it's crazy. But uh, I mean, this was this, I mean, we see a lot of portal cavernomas, but I have never seen anything so solid like this. But when you do a search for mass forming portal cavernomas, you, <laughs> you will find it, it's been reported. 
Crazy. So just very cool. All right, that's that was me. Okay, anyone else? Oh, the one thing I wanted to just point out was it can present as you know biliary ductal uh, obstruction, like portal bilopathy type of a picture. Mm, yeah, that makes sense since it's so extensive too. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Have a great day, guys. Thanks.